Hello and welcome to the Mastermind Body and Spirit Show. I'm your host, Matt Belair. Today's guest is a former professional mixed martial artist who competed in the UFC and a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. In addition to being the co-owner and head instructor at Easton Training Center, he became the head coach of Elevation Fight Team, one of the country's most highly regarded MMA teams. Despite his success as a business owner and coach, in the summer of 2015, he suffered through a bout of severe anxiety, insomnia, and depression. Through the help of family, friends, and therapy, he was able to overcome his anxiety and now looks to give back to those who are suffering similar afflictions. Today, he can be found on the mats teaching and training with his students and peers. He is an active philanthropist and continues to donate his winnings to local charities. Welcome to the show, Elliot Marshall. What's up, Matt? How are you, man? Do you like Matt or do you like Matthew? Oh, there's good, Matt or Matthew, whatever. All right, baby, let's go. Yeah, man. Well, it's great to have you on the show. I said at the beginning, I've seen you fight, um, competing in the UFC, the, the top <laughs> tier of, of what mixed martial arts is and a high-level Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, practitioner winning competitions, competing at the highest level, which anybody who's done Brazilian jiu-jitsu before or knows martial arts knows how hard that is and uh, the level of competition. So that's really amazing stuff. But what's really cool to see when I, when I got to look at your work and what you're doing now with the podcast, with what, you're, with what you're working on with the gym, you know, all this stuff to give back and help kids, I think it's truly amazing. So why don't you give the audience a little bit of background about yourself um, and uh, just why you're up to what you're doing today. And so uh, thanks for the compliments, first of all. Um, but, uh, no, I didn't do that alone. I, I had so much help along the way. So, um, thank you to everyone that's helped me and, and still continues to help me, uh, grow and, and be the person that, uh, that I am. So what was your question? Your question was, you know, how did we get here? Right. I think so. Uh, I was born, uh, to an African American dad and a Jewish, uh, Holocaust surviving grandparents. So that was, that's on my mom's side. So that was a very interesting upbringing for me. Um, Never really fit in. Didn't really didn't really work out for me anywhere except for in this martial arts area, you know. Um, so I just stuck with that. So I, I did martial arts my whole life. Uh, a Korean karate called Subak Do, and then right towards the end of of that, like I was I was like seventeen or eighteen years old, getting ready to move to college. A couple of the guys um, started doing this jujitsu stuff. So it was like 1997, 19, 1998, somewhere in there, and uh, they they kicked one of one guy kicked my ass because i had no clue what it was and then i was in love man you know like it must it just must be who i am like the the suffering of it i was like oh my god i gotta learn that shit and then you know i moved away to colorado met a mall easton in a mall and uh yeah what do you want to know man that was it that was it and the, the rest is history they say yeah, well, that, that's the short story. Well, you, you competed on the, the Ultimate Fighter Series. You're looking to make a go at, at being the best fighter you could, you could be, competing yeah. against the best in the world. So yeah. you've obviously learned a lot about uh, martial arts, but also uh, mindset and, and performance and things like that. So I guess uh, I'll, I'll start with what's the, what's the most important thing martial arts has taught you so far? Oh, it's taught me how to have the devil's arm around my neck and keep going and not to give up. You know, because I, I'm not a particularly religious person. I do, I do believe in heaven. And I don't know if I believe in heaven. I definitely believe in hell. But I think, uh, I, I think I believe in heaven. I'm not sure. I always go back and forth on that one. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that hell, hell does not happen after we die. Hell happens now. Hell, hell is an experience that we go through while alive. I'm not sure about what happens after we die or anything like that. Couldn't, and I don't really care. Um, but the devil's coming for us all. He's going to come say hello to us at some point. And jujitsu for me has taught me how to just chill with him. Not, not necessarily understand that, yeah, his arm is around my neck. And what I have to do right now is I just got to chill. I can't freak out. I can't go nuts. I just have to relax. I just have to be like, you know what? This is where I am. I allowed to curse? You can, but if you don't, then I don't have to put a mature content on it. So try, try. Okay. It's up All to right. you. If they slip out, it's not the end of the world. Right. I Sorry. sometimes slip up. <laughs> I was about to, and I was like, oh, let me check this out. <laughs> um, so, you know, you just got to hang out, man. You, you, you can't, the devil's going to go away when he goes away. Just like my anxiety is going to go away when it goes away. I, I, and, and that's what it's taught me how to do. It's taught me how to be calm. It's taught me how to be patient. It's taught me how to, 
how to just chill in really bad, sh- uh, sucky situations. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, when you're talking about that, what it makes me, uh, what it reminds me of, David Goggins' new book, and he just talks about getting uncomfortable in like uncomfortable situations, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I think that's a big part of it now is, is we're, we can be soft, you know, and people avoid these challenging situations, but when you know it's a part of life and you build up, what are the, the grit, the character, the mindset, or the perspective to overcome those challenges, it can be a very empowering thing. And I think, you know, jiu-jitsu is definitely a good teacher for that, any martial arts really. And so why don't we, why don't we go a little bit into the, the anxiety piece? Yeah. Because by any standard, you are doing well. You know, you're competing at the highest level. You have a success. I wasn't gym. competing at the highest level anymore. I was, I was done. I was retired. Um, is, is that what it set in? I know a lot of athletes have that when they, when they retire, they have I a real struggle. Uh, you know, that might have been part of it. It was three years. Of, no, it was five years later that it came. You know, so it wasn't, uh, it wasn't right, right away. It wasn't like a couple months. But we got the we got the school set up, you know, and they were they were doing very well. So I, I had I didn't have to worry about any money. I didn't have to worry about. I mean, you always have to you have to worry and be concerned, right? Like the school could do poorly, but I wasn't currently worried about how I was going to pay my bills or anything like that. My life was good. I had two beautiful kids. I have a beautiful wife. House is amazing. Taking great vacations, and then all of a sudden, there 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 she was. There there he was. There that that devil came to say hello. Um, and, and I didn't, I, I had no answers because this is the, this is the worst that it ever was. Like I I'd had it previously and it was bad. It was, it was bad the other times, but this was the worst because I, the other times I didn't have children. It was just me. So, um, when you think, when you think about that checkout point, right? Like of you not being here anymore, your existence, yeah, it's just you, you know? Yeah. Your mom, dad will be sad you know, not, it's, it's okay. When you have kids, man, that changes that shit. You know, that you're like, God damn, I, ah, like it, it just, it does something different to the level of the anxiety that you're having. For me, it did anyway. Uh, I, I shouldn't speak to anybody else's experience because I don't know their experience, but it was very intense. It was very awful. It lasted about six months, the intenseness of it. And yeah, I had some friends and family that just that just stuck with me, man. I couldn't sleep, and they would, they, I would, I would take my sleeping pills, and within five minutes, wanting to go to sleep, I would then immediately go into a panic attack because I wasn't sleeping. Um, last time I checked, um, no, no um, pill works in five minutes. <laughs> but don't try to explain that logic to uh, someone who's not in the right state, right? So yeah, I'd lose it, go downstairs, call my friends, have a couple panic attacks on the phone. And then they would just talk to me. They'd calm me down. And yeah, sometimes I'd fall asleep and sometimes I wouldn't. And on the nights that I wouldn't, they were on the phone with me all night. Wow. That sounds rough, man. And you know, I think what you're alluding to, and I'll just say the words, cause I know it's a real big issue these days, but suicide and taking your own life. And I don't know if it got that bad for you, but I know that Okay, good. Because a lot of the, you know, what I'm seeing out there is actually the teen suicide rates going up. A lot of people are experiencing anxiety, depression, and they have no support system. So it's getting a lot worse. So for you, was there a turning point that that helped you get out of this? Or was it a slow process with the help of friends and family and things like that? So um, I want to say for the most part, I think the research shows that most people with anxiety don't do the whole suicide thing. The Depression does. Now your, you know, your anxiety can then lead to depression. They're like cousins, you know? Um, but the anxiety leads when it gets really bad and you can't handle it, it leads to, will this ever end? And then if you conclude, no, this will never end, then you get depressed. And then we start really worrying about suicide and things like that. Um, so I never got there. I did wake up one morning and think about what it would be like if I did do that. And that was a really bad day. Uh, That was the first thought that I had. I opened my eyes and then boom, there was the thought, which you can't like, there's no control over it. Like I I didn't like think myself into it. Uh, That was a shitty day. But also it broke that day for about 12 hours after, after it broke it, um, I had, I had clarity for, for about 12 hours. It was really nice. <laughs> I 
came back the next day, not, not as intensely as that day, but, um, what got me out of it was a long process, a long process, process of changing, I would say, or just adjusting how I went through my life in my mind and, um, some mindfulness, some mental training, a lot of meditation, a lot of fucking therapy. Sorry, I cursed again. Um, and great support, you know, and great support. Um, two, two definite instances that stick out and they both happened on the same day. I didn't sleep. I had two nights of no sleep and I come upstairs from the basement because that's where I would run to when it was going ugly. And my wife said, Hey, why don't you just try to do your day as though you did sleep? Like just pretend like, like we're, we're all really good at pretending we pretend about the Easter bunny and Santa Claus and all that stuff when we're young. So just pretend. And I said, okay, so that got me out of the house. <laughs> that, that, that was amazing. And then I was at work and I was getting ready to teach uh, some of my students and, and one, and one of my friends, Ian, who was one of the guys that was staying up with me at the night uh, during the night at the time, he was there. He's the general manager of one of my schools. He came in and he put, it was four o'clock and he puts this cup of coffee in front of me. And he goes, drink that. And I'm like, no. I was like, no, I'm not fucking, dr- sorry. I'm not drinking that because if I drink that, it's four o'clock. I'm not going to sleep tonight. And he goes, dude, you're already not sleeping. So drink the coffee. You'll feel better right now, at least for an hour. Right? The coffee will help you for an hour. When 11 o'clock comes and you're not sleeping, you're going to call me and I'll be here. We'll deal with 11 o'clock when 11 o'clock comes. Right now is four. Feel better at four. Hello. So did it work? Did oh yeah. You end up sleeping. Oh oh um. Did I end up sleeping that night? Yeah, I actually slept that night. So he because <laughs> that's, that's so, right. so hold on. So you're waiting for me. So he, so eleven o'clock came. I started no. When I left that night, he goes, "Look, this is what you're gonna do." He's like, "When you get home tonight, okay, you're going to go downstairs just like you normally do. Take your sleeping pills. Turn the TV on, and watch a movie." try to stay awake all night. I was like, that doesn't sound like a good plan, dude. I'll do that. (laughs) (laughs) He goes at 1230. I'll be sitting by my phone. If you're, if you need to call me, call me. And I said, okay. And then uh, I called him at eight in the morning. (laughs) Amazing. Well, well, one thing I'm noticing is, is having that support, I think is super important. It's great that you had uh, some support around you. And I I guess I'm curious, you know, you, you recently wrote a book, the gospel of fire strategies for facing your fears, confronting your demons and finding your purpose. When did you get the inspiration to, to write that book? Did you feel like it was important to share your story? And I'd love for you to share some of those strategies because I think facing your fears is incredibly important. And if we can kind of push those boundaries on a daily basis, we're going to have more courage to follow our inspirations, you know, overcome any kind of challenges we might be going through. But, you know, I think that's a theme that everybody can relate to. So I want to be clear, first of all, I was just lucky enough that my anxiety was just bad enough because we don't know what would have happened if it was 10% worse. Right. Like, so I don't want to take a lot. I'm not, I'm not down with taking a lot of credit for the things that I've been able to do or accomplish. Because again, I don't believe in self-made. I believe somebody, some, somebody helped you along the way, you know, and just some random luck of the universe, whatever you want to call it. Like if my anxiety would have been 10% worse, I can't say what would have or wouldn't have happened. So um, the book you asked, excuse me. Uh, so I have a friend, Scott Strode, who was a, t- a CNN hero. I don't know what year, 2014, maybe. One of the top 10 guys that gets on the, the, the CNN end of the year thing. And he, he, so he had to give a speech that night because he was on stage on CNN and he had a lady that helped him and he put me in touch with her because he was like, dude, you gotta, you gotta talk, man. You talk, you, your, your message is amazing, you know? And I was like, well, thanks, man. So he bought me two hours or something with, with, a, with his lady and she, we sat down and she does this thing. Her name is Aaron Weed. She's amazing. I, I love Aaron. I almost cursed again, but I stopped myself. Uh, I love Aaron. And she does this thing called the dig where she finds, she just asks all these questions. She puts sticky notes up all over the office to find one word that describes you, that, that, that is your thing. So we did that. And my word is power, you know? Uh, so I end everything now with find your power. 
because I want everyone to find their power. And she was like, look, I'm not sure if talks are, are quite your thing yet because I'm pretty raw. I curse, as you can see. And most people can get down with it once they know me a little bit. So she was like, a podcast and a book. So the podcast was simple. So I have the podcast. That's pretty inexpensive, I, I think, as you know. Uh, the book, on the other hand, when I called this company that she put me in touch with, they were like, man, 25K. I was like, 25K? Damn. Right? Like, so... <laughs> <laughs> So I had to just change my mind around it. And the way I changed my mind around it was I was like, man, imagine if I write this book and imagine if one person hits me up and says, yo, man, your book changed my life. Would that be worth $25,000? If, if somebody, right, I'm going to ask you, if you had to take out a $25,000 loan, but there was somebody that you knew and that knows you right now, well, maybe doesn't. But they were sincere. They were like, yo, I was about to end it. I was, I was about to check out. And that one thing changed my, and that's what you made me not do it because of that, that $25,000 that you spent. Would that be worth a $25,000 loan? Yeah. Well, there it is. Oh, man, that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of, it's heavy, but important. You know, I so think then, I'm going to interrupt you for one sec. Sorry. So then the, then the goal didn't become about money. Mm. The goal didn't become about, am I going to get my $25,000 back? The goal became about write a fuck, write a book that someone's going to write you that email. Like that's how open and honest and vulnerable and all of those words you have to be. You have to write that good of a book that someone's like, damn, bro. So there it was. Amazing. Well, it does take a, a ton of courage to share those things, especially, you know, you'd think a martial arts space and you're supposed to be, you know, quote unquote, gladiator, or manly or whatever. So you can't be vul vulnerable or weak. It's kind of what our society is pushing these days anyway for, for men. It's incorrect. And, yeah. So a hundred percent. So to write a book like that, I think is inspiring. So can you share, you know, some of your, your best strategies or, or something like, how would you speak to somebody who's suffering right now in anxiety or depression? Like, do you have anything, uh, any stories or any or strategies that may help you or, or any message you want to give to them? So I want to be super clear. I don't have any answers other than what I did and how I do and how I go through my day. So this is like, I, I don't, I'm not an expert. Uh, so I want to be super clear on that. I don't want anybody to be like, damn, do this and it will be better. Uh, I have no want for it to be better because I can't control that. I just have to do today, this very, very moment, the best I can. And then I have steps that I know that help me do that. I wake up and I meditate immediately. And I go to the bathroom first. <laughs> I wake up and I meditate. I missed today actually because I woke up late. And then after that, I do a little learning time. And then after that, I do a little exercise. And then after that, I, I go through my day. I go through my day. So the first thing is meditation, mindfulness meditation, focusing on the breath, understanding, really understanding that all I have is this moment. You know, I, I don't have any other moment. So some of, the, some of the ways that I learned this process are I tried to notice how did I, how many times, I tried to notice that the, how many times I could catch the moment my butt left the seat and not a second before and not a second after because the reason is we're always standing up to do something something that's in the future whether it be go to the bathroom or go open the refrigerator it's not the moment you're in that's the future can you can you notice one single moment of your butt getting up so it's like to teach you the moment and then man I, I read a lot a lot of stoicism you know, a lot of stoicism. I'm starting to get into some Buddhism right now. I really like, you know, my friend Alex Huddleston just sent me, uh, sent me this book, uh, Zen and the Samurai. And you mentioned like a second ago about uh, it's not it's, it's not what we're telling men to do, you know, uh, especially I know you mentioned martial arts guys and gladiators. Look, what the gladiators did was they took their life and they put it down in front of somebody else. And they said, here's my life for the taking. They enter the arena over and over and over again. That's our job. A, a toughness is not about not entering the arena. Toughness is not about 
going in and doing something and, and trying not to lose tough toughness is about going and doing something and say, I'm going to kill or be killed. And that's, that's the, that's the idea. One or the other. No, no, uh, no, no protection. A lot of skills, right? A lot of skills so that you don't be killed, <laughs> right? I'm not, I'm not saying go fight a bull if you don't know how to fight a bull. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but gain the skills and then, and then just keep anteing up. That's what a warrior does. You, you just keep stepping up to the, just keep stepping in the fight. Whatever your fight is, show up to it every day. Don't worry about yesterday and don't worry about tomorrow. Just today. Step up to the hard things in your life right now. Yeah, man. When you're saying that, it reminds me a lot of what I hear about fear anyway. And I've actually been researching fear quite a bit recently and, and doing some training myself to overcome things that I'm afraid of. So, you know, I'm afraid of really dark, like going into the dark forest and, and, and being nowhere and having no light and hearing the sounds. And I'm okay sometimes, but it freaks me out sometimes. So I've been purposefully going into the, the darkest nights I can find and going trail running. And I did it all last year in Nelson, British Columbia, where there's bears and there's cougars. It might not be the smartest thing, but I had asked people around town. They're like, no, no one's been attacked in, in years. So I was like, okay. So as I would show up and kind of put myself in that situation over time, uh, the feeling of fear was less. But the big thing that I've been learning and then I realize is that the Do you fear think doesn't the fear, always... Hold on. Do you think the yep. feeling of fear was less or you just got good with it? I don't know. I think, well, it's it, the feelings started to leave my body either way. I didn't have that same kind of anxiety. Also, like uh, just from being exposed to it, you start to get used to it. And so I think the big thing that I learned is that, you know, courage or fear or, or anything like that, it might, it might not go away, but you show up anyway. And I've heard this, maybe you can speak on this, but I've heard that there's many UFC fighters that would say, you know, I go to, into the ring and I'm afraid. You know, these guys are going to compete and they're going to get punched right in the face You Bro. know, and they're, they're afraid going in. It's like, oh, crap. You know, you want to be confident going in, but that'd be you showing up to test, you know? Look, we all wish the building would fall down. I think, you know, like <laughs> nobody die. Nobody die. Maybe there could just be a power outage so that they can't air. It. So many guys are like this, you know, but, but, that's, but that's courage. Walk. Courage, courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage is fear. Go. Rule number four for my kids, I have six rules. And rule number four is if we're afraid, we have to do it. Don't get stupid. Don't go jump off a building. So please don't, don't make that analogy because no one's saying to do that um, without a parachute, <laughs> right? Yeah. But if you're, if you're afraid, it's, it's, it's got to be your trigger point. Like, hey, you hear that knock? That's fear. Open the door. Yeah. I 100% agree. And I, and I think that, you know, with what's going on again, culturally is it, we're, as a society seems very soft and very comfortable, and we're kind of steering away from those things that are challenging. But I love that rule. I'm curious, what are the other, what are the other six rules you have for your kids? I want to come back to that society thing for a sec, because I think we go too harsh on that sometimes. Um, rule number one is you have to do jujitsu. Rule number two is you have to learn how to swim. This is my second book, by the way, that I'm writing. Um, six rules of life for you and your kids. I love it. Uh, so rule number three is look people in the eye, demand respect and respect them back. Rule number four is if you're scared, you have to do it. Rule number five is you make your money work for you and you don't work for your money. And then rule number six is you ride or die. If my brother goes down, I go down. Wow. That's going to be an interesting one. I'm looking forward to checking that out. Yeah. Okay. So what do you want to say on the society part? The society thing, man, look, it's all with good intention. It's not with poor intentions. We're trying to do the best, what, what we thought was the best we could as a society. It was just a mistake, hmm. right? It's, it's just a mistake. Things like not having a scoreboard for our kids, not having grades in school, um, thinking uh, I'll get a little political. There's two fucking genders, guys. There's male and female. Uh, that's it there's there's no more <laughs> it's been that way it's been, that's just what it is if you would like to change yours i am all for it go the fuck ahead have at it god you're gonna have to put the the maturity sorry man. <laughs> yeah, sorry dude. it happened a long time ago man this isn't for kids <laughs> um yeah you know like go ahead i'm all for it but there's two there's not you know you can't wake up one day and be a flower you're a human being and that's what you are so and you're male or female and so 
we, these, what are you going to, you have to accept these things. Like there are some certain things that, that the way that's, that's how the world works. And, and we have to just stick in them. It gets tricky. It's hard, right? For example, it's hard to watch your kid cry when they lose. It's hard. I'm sure it's hard. I haven't experienced it. It's hard. I'm sure it's very, very hard for your, when you have a child that thinks that, that they're a boy and they think they're a girl and they want to do that. Like that, I'm sure these are really tricky, tricky, hard things, but that's what we've got to do. We've got to do the hard stuff. This is what makes us amazing that we have the cognitive ability to do that. So let's do it. Stop avoiding it. Yeah, I agree. We need to do a lot more of the hard things. So when you look at society as a whole, do you, what yeah. thing would you like to like shift culturally? You know, if there's like an idea or belief or something that you see that's maybe a little bit rampant, you know, if, what, how would you influence that and why? So I'm stealing this from The Coddling of the American Mind, this is a book by Jonathan Haidt, and it was really good. Are we preparing our kids for the road or are we preparing the road for our children? Which one? Just that idea. We have to prepare your child for the road. Mm. Right? You have to prepare your child for the road because you don't know the road. You don't know what the road's going to be. You can't prepare the road. There's who knows what it's going to look like. Who would ever think that, like, let's stay on the sex change thing for a second. Who would ever think that their child would want a sex change? Like that's almost, or that their child would be so uncomfortable, right? That they, that, that was, that was the option for them, man. Could you, I, I can't imagine what that, what, what that must be like. You can't prepare for that. But you got to prepare the child. You got to pre prepare the soul, the person, to now be able to go through that experience. It's gonna be really, really hard, right? That's gonna be so hard. That their life is going to be super difficult for years. And if all you've done is prepare the road for the child leading up to that, the sex change ain't gonna help. Well, what you're speaking on, what it reminds me of is that old saying of, uh, you know, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day, you know, teach him to fish, he'll have, uh, you know, be able to eat for a lifetime. And also just character development and understanding adversity. One of the things that when I'm coaching or training and especially around athletes is the understanding that failure is a part of it. You know, that when you understand that failure is going to be a part of whatever you do, um, then you can have a, a more empowering perspective around that because people sometimes won't even try because they're afraid of the failure. And that's the same thing to go with adversity or challenges or what you're afraid of. If you give your, if you can create a, at least an empowering perspective enough to show up, enough to try, enough to give it an attempt, then you're going to be moving forward and you're going to be growing. Um, but if, if all those fears and all those challenges are going to keep you from not attempting anything, it's going to be a lot harder to do the things that you're inspired to do, whether it's following your dreams or, you know, creating the relationships you want or, you know, learning anything because you're going to be too afraid to do anything. You're going to be stuck in this, you know, mental prison, so to speak. Yeah, you have to. Yes. Yeah. Yes. On all of that. Like, that's exactly <laughs> what it is. But, you know, it's, Again, it's not done out of, I don't believe it's done out of malice. It's not, um, it's done out of ignorance. So that, therefore, like we, sometimes we can just be a little too harsh on the people that are doing it. And I, I find myself doing this too, right? You're like, God, fuck, you know, <laughs> like you get so mad at them for, for, for running it, how they're running it. And, it, mm. and it, but look, we, we can all only do what we're doing in the moment. We, I, I'm not a believer in free will. So, mm. um, that we're two things. We are our chemical makeup and our past experience. So we have in, in the moment, in each and every moment, we have no choice but to make the one we make. So you don't think we have free will? I don't think we have free will, no. Could you go on that? That's very interesting. I'd love to hear your perspective why you don't think we have free will. Mm, uh, can you summarize or is, you can pass if movie. you wish. Think, think of a movie. <laughs> okay. You got it? Yeah. Think of another movie. You got it? Yeah. What's your first movie? The Matrix. Why? This first one popped into my mind. Why? I don't know. I asked you to make a choice and you have no fucking clue, huh? Well, that's a choice of a thought to so, give an answer. So hold on. I just asked you to make the most simple choice in the world. Think of a movie. Mm -hmm. And you can't even tell me why it happened. No. Okay. What was your second movie? The Lion King. The Lion King. <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. So I, I asked, had like a flutter. Yeah, you had like two simple, simple questions. It's the, as simple as it could possibly be. 
Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that means they don't have free will, though. Where'd it come from? I don't know. Well, that's the whole infinite mystery of being alive, man. That's like past, the boy. That's like the meditation type of stuff. Why is anything? <laughs> past, past experience and chemical makeup. That's why. All right. so, what about? You know, what are your thoughts on simulation theory? I don't even know what that is. Oh, okay. Well, it's sorry. <laughs> no, we're like it, the idea that we're living in a simulation. Oh yeah, that's very possible. Yeah. That, that could super. <laughs> that could be super possible. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. I uh, I think I yeah. It could be yeah. It could totally be possible. But like the free will thing, it it, it allows what it does for me is it is it allows me not to take credit for as much and it allows me not to blame for as much because I don't believe we ha- I again because. It's, the, it's like take the two brothers, take the twins who, who have the alcoholic father who beats them. They have the same exact experiences because they were born at the same time. They, they can't have different experiences, correct? So you, and they're, the only thing that's different is the chemical makeup of their brain, right? Of, what, of what's going on in their brain. Because one of them often not often, but you know, we've all seen it. One of them turns out to be an alcoholic and the other one turns out to be totally sober. Go, I'm never touching that shit in my fucking life. And there it is. What, the only difference is the chemical makeups. The experience was the same and they play a 50-50 role. So, and we, and, and, and I know we don't, I, I, I'm not, I could easily have my mind changed. I'm not one of, uh, I'm not, I'm not someone who's like, oh, nope, this is the way it's got to be. So I could easily, you know, but for, for me right now, it's working. Hmm. Well, I, you know, for me, I've always, I, I definitely think that we have free will. I, w- I would go the, like, are you the other? Well, and, but again, I, I don't know for sure. I think that there's the chemical makeup, but we also have like perspective and learning and education. And like, you could be maybe overweight and then you, you have the choice whether to eat KFC again or go for a run. And there might be a history trauma um, things that really pull you past hereditary things that really make it challenging. But if it's no free will, then I, I feel like, you know what, then I'm not influencing my reality. Then I'm just like, I'm just a victim. But then it comes into the idea of like the super Zen concept of just surrendering to everything that is. But I think I, I like the idea that I influence the reality. I don't create it all. So <laughs> what are you nodding over there? What do you think? Yeah, I'm agreeing. With, when I'm going like this, I'm yes. When I'm going like this, I'm no. I agree with you. What you're talking yes, no. about is you're, in, you're influencing experience. So that's why I do what I do. Because now I can change your, I can change someone's experience. I can change their history. Because everyone, that's the next question everyone asks me then. Dude, if you don't have free, if we don't have free will, well, then why do you waste all this damn time doing what you do? Well, it's because I can, I can, make, I can be the, I can be the thing that goes ah! in someone's, in someone's history. I, mm. could, I could be the, the, my book could be the thing that goes, oh shit, let me take this gun out of my mouth. Well, exact. Well, yeah, that's the, that's the so, ultimate free will thing. You know, but, do you, can you find the perspective, the memory, the anything in your mind to make a choice that would be an empowering choice because so, we're so, every day it's, it's little choices and so, the better we're at habits. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So, yeah, I agree with you. I'm not saying that there's not a thing called choice. Of course, there's a thing called choice. Am I going to drink the water now or am I going to drink this water that's in my right hand in five seconds? Of course, I'm making a choice, but that choice has already been made because of my past experience and my chemical makeup. That's what I'm saying. I'm try- I, can't hand- I can't touch someone's chemical makeup. Yours, mine, right? Only drugs can do that. Can I touch their experience? That's that's the only thing that, that we have the control over is the experience. So let's, let's make the experiences as positive and informative and skillful and successful as we can so that we can get the best possible choices being made in each and every moment. Of course, there's choice. I'm not saying there's no choice. Like, I, li- I like, yeah, I, li- I like what you impossible. said about experience. So well, what I'm curious about, I wanted to switch gears because it's been on my mind a little bit, but you've also started a podcast. I think it, how many episodes you got? Like 60, 70, 60 something, something like that. Yeah, yeah something that's cool. Well. So for you, how's that experience been? And what's the, what's like the top thing that you've learned talking, you know, you're talking to, you know, some pretty amazing athletes, some pretty amazing people that, uh, 
you know, I've done a lot, you know, I've achieved a great deal of success. Have you seen any common themes or learned um, anything in particular? Yeah. All the guys that I've talked to that have been champions have sat down in their hotel room that night and been like, God damn, what now? Hmm. Wow. What, what happens tomorrow? And it happened. And the same thing that happens to them is the thing that happens to the person that they just beat up. The sun comes up. Hmm. You know, the sun comes up. So let's make the most of today. And for some people, that championship crushed them. And for some people, that championship sparked them. So those are that, that, that is a very interesting, uh, I don't know what, a uh, quagmire, I guess you would say, I, I don't know what it is, right? Like yeah. it's a very interesting spot in history that you can go, Oh, look at that. Cause that, that moment happened. Now what, mm. now what the people that loved you still loved you. And the people that don't still don't, those people that don't might try to grab a hold of you now because they want, they might want some of you. They might want some of your shine. They might want some of your star, but, you know, but the people that really love you, they loved you anyway. And they would have loved you no matter how that experience went. It's like your child. Do you have children? Yeah. If your child killed somebody, would you stop loving them? No. You would not like them. True. I'd be pretty pissed. She's You'd a, be pretty pissed. She, she's, <laughs> a, she's only six weeks little girl. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't even oh, my congratulations. Right All right, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying when she gets older, right? When she gets yeah, older, I, my crap. kids aren't, you know, when she gets older, if she, you know, uh, the worst people, like, you know, the, the worst thing in the world, like the kid who, the kid who, uh, in, uh, Sandy hook, mm. right. Like the kid who did that, his mom's, his mom and dad still love him. Mm. Right. He might, is he dead? They he killed himself. Right. Yeah. He's dead, but they still love him. They love him. They, you can't not, well, that's always true. So that's been the most interesting thing is talking to people that have been super successful is that when their, when their success ended, it was only the people that loved them. It wasn't any of any of the shit that came before. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting. You say that, you, you know, the, the book that I wrote Zen athlete is about, you know, mindset for sports. And I, my hope is to bring it to kids. And when I just, are it, you a Buddhist? I studied Buddhism. I went to Nepal and meditated with monks, but I don't okay. say I'd, I've read books. It doesn't make me a Buddhist. I just there's no Buddhist that. that believes in free will, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, see, I, I love the Buddhist philosophy. I, I specifically like the, you know, the, the four noble truths and the, uh, the eightfold path I think is all super fantastic. And when I was in Nepal meditating with the Buddhist monks, they were uh, such a grounded, wise, just a beautiful mindsets. They're really empowering, but you know, when I'm teaching people and especially kids is like, how do I break this down to the most simple idea? Because I've heard this before time and time again, but if you're teaching a kid to throw a basketball shot, first thing is to clear their mind. A kid that's able to clear their mind just for a second and somebody who cannot is more empowerment for the choice that's coming. The second thing is visualize the shot going in, teaches them that they influence the reality. Third is they might miss the shot. What's the most powerful and positive perspective in that situation? But fourth, the overall encompassing idea, the final chapter is about Zen. And, you know, it doesn't encompass Zen for what Zen philosophy is exactly per se, but it is more the idea that can you be whole, complete, full of self-love and worth now as you go through the journey? Because if you want to be a world champion, that's going to be a whole lifetime. If you want to be a champion athlete, that's going to be a whole lifetime. Like, you know, I'm, I'm Canadian, so I follow more hockey. And there's a guy, Alexander Ovechkin, one of the best players in the world, finally won a cup. And I was so stoked for him a couple of years ago. But that high of winning the Stanley Cup lasts like a, that moment of carrying the cup around. And then there's that day. And then maybe a week you get your city. And then it's, it's over. It They're like, on to the next, on to the next. So how do you process that? Because it's almost that, that carrot, you know, the golden thing that they're handing the next day, whether it's an education or a job or more money or whatever, we're always looking to that next thing rather than having everything that we need here right now in this experience as we move through it, champion or no champion. I think I agree with everything you said except for the first thing that you needed to be able to do to teach a kid. You don't think you should clear their mind? No, you got to love them. Oh, yeah. Got to love them. I if don't know don't how the – Kids don't, kids don't learn unless they, unless they feel safe with you. Mm. So then after they feel safe with you, then all of those things, mm. but if they, but they, they shut down, we shut down as children, because if you if they, that's the first thing that all of us need is safety. We need to know that in this particular situation that I'm going to be okay. 
and that regardless of anything, I'm going to be okay because they can't protect themselves. Right. So that, that's, that's been their whole experience ever since birth is somebody making sure that they're okay, which we can't, which we have to, that's the animal in us. Yeah. And the, the teacher that, the teacher to actually care. And I imagine with you being, being a coach that you're teaching young kids as well. I teach everyone. Yeah. Then the, even my own kids, like they can't, there's no learning if they think that the love is on the line. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Right? If they, if, if they think dad's going to like abandon them because of the A, B or C, there's no learning. It's not possible. It, it can't be done. It, it, even the greats that, that say my dad motivated me because he beat the shit out of me. At some point that comes back to haunt that person, mm. you know? So there, there it ends, it, it ends and it ends terribly. You have to, you, the love can never be on the line and they have to know that they're okay. And then you can be as hard as you want on them, right? You, you can say, no, you can use disappointment. You can use all of these things, but they know, they have to know, they really, really have to know that once you love them, the love is never on the line again. Mm. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. And I think that's a great uh, caveat that I never even considered before. What about, you know, ideally, in the school system and those spaces that the teachers still care, you know, that the, as I think the kids like as long, as long as they're cared about when they're going to school and we're going to these places, because if the kids feel cared about and they feel loved and they feel important, you know, then, then they're going to try. And even when they're rebellious, when they're kids, they still want that. It's just, they don't know how to, they don't know how to communicate. And that's why martial arts and coaches in general are so important because a lot of the time they don't have that at the home structure. They're learning all these different skills uh, outside the family structure where they're supposed to be navigating like what life is, you know, what's important, what are my values, you, you know, what are the beliefs from the, the family home? So being able to go to a space and do you notice this? Like, I know that you, you um, started competing again in jujitsu and then you're giving the money back uh, yeah. to the community. So maybe you can speak about that. Cause I think that's amazing. So I've been super blessed in my life. Again, I said, I'm not religious. I don't know by what, so I, and I don't really care that I don't have to worry uh, financially and my schools are, are good. Uh, when therapy came, when, when, when my breakdown came, I have a friend who's a, who's a doctor takes care of me for free, man. Uh, there's no, I don't pay him. Uh, and so, and normally that's crazy expensive, right? Like going to see a doctor. And then I got also, I go to therapy every week. And, I, and if I needed to go twice a week, I went twice a week. Didn't even think about the cost of it. So just, I got to be able to give that back to people who, who aren't so fortunate as me because that uh, was luck. Like, sure. I worked really hard and all, and all that stuff, but a lot of that, a lot of, a lot of the, a lot of, why I am where I am today, I didn't have anything to do with. So let's try to, let's try to change that for somebody else. Let's try to get some dust, that luck dust, and try to sprinkle it on as many people as possible. And then maybe they can go be amazing. Hmm. And so when you're working with the kids or the community, like what is, your, what is your hope that, what are you seeing out there in the community now? Like what is your hope for these kids to, to learn and to grow? Do you see them, you know, like what's want, the climate out in, in I that want area? Them, I want them to find whatever it is they love and learn how to go get it, you know, and just understand that it's not easy that, uh, that we or someone, your coach, your teacher, somebody will be there for you. We will be there for you along the way, but you are going to have to work. You know, you are going to have to grind. You don't have to do it alone. You'll never have to do it alone. You know, especially for like my two kids, dad, daddy, as long as, as long as this heart is beating, you know, and, and this brain is working that I will be here until the day they die, whatever, whatever they need, uh, or the day I die, I hope not the day they die. Um, so yeah, we're, we're in, we're in, if my kid wants to be a ballerina and man, I don't, I don't know shit about ballet, but we're going, <laughs> right. We're going like, ah, uh, I'm coaching flag football right now, man. I never played football a day in my life. I mean, I love football, but never played like played football organized. I don't know anything. I got to get on YouTube, man. You can learn anything on YouTube, but that's my job. That's my job. Now I'm not going to be their coach. And I don't, I didn't want to be the coach, by the way, it just had to happen out that way. I want them to have their own identity, but uh, w without me, but they, it, they, it was necessary that it wasn't going well. So someone's got to step up and coach. I kind of know how to coach. So, Okay. Uh, and yeah, so I got to get on YouTube. I got, I got to call friends. I got to learn. I got to learn plays. I got, there's, there's stuff to do now. There's stuff to do. Why my kids love football, 
love it. They're not allowed to play tackle yet. No way. So the only option is flag. They absolutely love this. So what's, what's, it, what's on me now? Learn, learn. I, I got I to gotta learn so that we can do this the best. Hmm. And so now what I'm interested in and what I'm curious about, now you, you've got this gym, you're competing again, things are going smoothly, you got the book. For you, what, what would the next five years look like in an ideal way? If you could kind of sprinkle your own fairy dust on the influence you're, you're trying to share and the things that you're working towards, what does that look like for you? What do I want? You're saying I want, I want as many people standing one inch behind me as possible, you know, so that, that we're walking, we're walking into the fire. We're walking into the darkness and we're going to shine light on the darkness. You know, we're going to burn, we're going to burn and we're going to, we're going to stand in that middle of that, not, not that orange flame, that blue flame. And we're going to take it. We're going to forge our swords together. I just want as many people to come on the ride with me. That, like there's nothing else that I really want. I, uh, you know, I do want a private jet at some point. I, I hate waiting in lines, man. I hate waiting in lines. It kills me. You know, it kills me. If you so, get one, pick me up. No. Pick me up to show me some jujitsu, man. You know, because that, <laughs> from what I understand, the way the private jets work is you roll up, right? You leave your keys in the car and you walk on the damn plane <laughs> and there's an airport 10 minutes from my house so i'd have to leave you know if, if the plane was leaving at three i'd have to leave at 240 <laughs> that'd be amazing my house, that'd be amazing bro and i hate waiting the lines i have all the stuff i have tsa pre i have clear all that stuff <laughs> so i can <laughs> not wait in lines as long as as, as short as possible so i mean yeah i want to you know but that's a joke i hope everyone understands <laughs> Well, man, if you help, you know, millions of kids, you know, and people just, just the, the topic around anxiety and facing your fears is huge because I, I see a lot of the conversation go in a different way, like facing the darkness. Some people, you know, call it shadow work, but I think a lot of time when I'm looking into things like that, they don't have like a, it's not as well-rounded a perspective of somebody who's gone through it and said, Hey, like, you know, you can get past this and even just opening up the discussion because what I've learned through the podcast and, and coaching and speaking to a lot of different people is so many people suffer in silence and they don't want to share anything. And they feel like there's no, uh, there's no hope. And with social media now is everybody's highlight reel. So everybody thinks it's, you know, that championship belt, but to hear, you know, people who um, have gone through it, have gone, you know, through success, quote unquote, but have still felt this way. It, you know, brings it, back to that human experience and what's most important who's in your corner before you're the champion you know what are the things that are meaningful to you and how are you focusing on them i I don't know what success even really looks like man because i've failed at everything i've tried Hmm. you know every every single thing i've tried i've failed at so i I don't know what it looks like i'm not a i wasn't a world champion in jiu-jitsu i wasn't a world champion in in mma i wasn't a world champion now again in jiu-jitsu i'm you know i've won i've done i've done well um, my schools are successful, but I'm not a billionaire. So you, you know, what, what, what I, all I've done is fail. That's why I succeed. Michael Jordan said it best. Mm-hmm. You know, there's not, there's nothing, there's nothing out there except, for, except failure. So go ahead. Don't, you know, it is what it is. So that's, we, we, we're, we're, we're coddling our children from that, right? We're, we're, we're not letting them experience that. That's the only way we learn. You have a six, how old your baby? Uh, seven weeks. Seven weeks. So pretty soon, a couple months. I know. I know. Um, that's a, that seems like an eternity to you. Your baby's <laughs> gonna start uh, rolling over to its belly, right, and rolling over to its back, and you, it's gonna do this thing where it's gonna try, and, and then it's gonna be successful. And then he's then that baby's boy or girl, 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 and then she's gonna get up on her knees, but she's gonna as in, in this process, she's gonna just fall flat on her face a bunch. But then she's going to get up and she's going to be on all fours and she's going to rock. Right? And she's going to rock and she's like, oh, I'm going to move. Oh, I'm going to move. <laughs> and she's going to move and she's going to fall. And then she's going to build her base back up and then she's going to fall. And then, and then, oh man, here she goes. Oh man, and then she's crawling. And then when she crawls, she's going to crawl over to the couch. She's going to pick herself up. She's going to hold on to that couch and she's going to fall down. And she's going to hold on to that couch and fall down and just fall down and fall down and fall down. 
And then eventually she's going to be able to walk herself along the couch, like, you know, like move along the couch. Then eventually she's going to let go of that couch after she's fallen down a million times. And, you know, and now she, what she's going to try next is she's going to try to fail again, right? She's going to start to walk. She's going to take a step and fall, build herself back up on the couch, get her balance, let go of the couch and fall and fall and fall and fall. And then all of a sudden she's going to walk. And she's going to be moving. She's going to be walking. And she's going to be all over the place. Your life's going to be a fucking nightmare, you know, because she's because you used to have this thing that you could just put down in a spot and it wouldn't go anywhere. Now you don't have this thing that you can just put down in a spot because what she's going to do is she's going to walk over. She's going to try to open your cabinets and drink all your liquids that are real dangerous that you're going to have to stop her from doing. She's going to try to, you know, put her finger in an outlet. And then eventually she's going to be tall enough where she's going to try to touch a hot stove. You're going to let her touch that hot stove. You're not going to let her, but she's going to. But she's only going to touch that hot stove about one time because why? The failure was so intense that she's going to be like, oh, my God, that was terrible. I'm never going to do that again. So this is all we do, and we're taking that away. Now, look, I understand that you also you, – you can't just throw failure on a person really intensely once they can cognitively understand it because the baby doesn't understand it, right? It's, the baby is a very simple metaphor because – but it doesn't understand failure, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't change that that's what teaches us the best. We just have to, not, we have, we have to bring it down. Okay. From, from, we, you know, we can't just let our, we can't expect our first grader to be able to do calculus. That that's insane. <laughs> right. Correct. Yeah. But we have to let them fail in a way that, that they are ready for, you know, that they are ready for. I do agree with some of the things that have come out of the, coddling people say look man sometimes first graders are ready to read and sometimes kindergartners are ready to read and sometimes three-year-olds are ready to read don't force it they're they're gonna read okay right now is this your first child your little girl yeah first one everyone you know everyone you so i'm sure you have other parents that have newborn babies right like you guys are all like yeah mine's doing this and mine's doing that thing yeah. Right. And then they say, Oh, mine's, mine's going to talk. Oh, yours isn't talking yet. Oh, it's okay. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, yours is mine runs. Oh, yours. Da, da, da. Man, by the time they're five years old, they're all walking, talking and pooping. That's just what it is. And whether it happened at 10 months or 15 months, who cares? You don't even talk about it at five. Right. And then by 18, most of them are what? Driving a car. It's, it's, we don't, these aren't things that we talk about. They all can jump. They all can run. They all can, you know, so all, all these little markers, no, who cares when, when it happens? Let the child progress as the child is, is ready. Put some pressure on it, right? Because that's what you're going to do. You're going to start picking your baby up, right? Holding it up and all those things. Not yet. She's only six weeks. You're not trying we're doing, now, We're right? doing squats. We're doing squats. Yeah. I'm getting the leg motion for the squats. Yeah. I, I, was doing <laughs> squats man. I, was, I was doing triangle chokes with my kids. Yeah, exactly. Putting their yeah. legs in triangles, you know? Totally. <laughs> so, but, yeah. like, but you... So you have to add pressure and that's what we do. We add pressure, but it's got to be the right amount of pressure so that they can fail appropriately the whole, your whole life. That's why we succeed. It's the only re it's the only reason why we succeed. Yeah. 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 I totally agree. And it's, again, it's such a universal concept and there's, there comes an age or a time or something where many of us just become afraid to fail. And I think it was Zuckerberg's speech and many other speeches. It talks about failure and anybody who has been successful to any degree in anything, they failed more than the other people. They were, they were willing to keep trying and keep trying. So those concepts are, are incredibly important and we need to have the courage to get up. It's not, it's like, I remember that Rocky movie, you know, it's not so, so much about falling down it's about getting back up each and every time and and that's really the important thing but for real though right because when's for for most of us i think i think where the problem comes in for us as adults right why we have all this anxiety and depression and all you know and things like that why we have a midlife crisis you stop the learning mm -hmm. you stop yep. the learning and the trying and when you stop that what else is there you know, what else is there? We stop reading. When's the last time? I, I, don't, I don't think many adults read, right? Like, when's the last time that, that the whole state as an adult read a book? Everyone in your state. Imagine if everyone in your state that you live in right now would read a book this, this month, this month of October, a whole book front to back. How great would that be? What would that start? Well, think about the innovation, but we stop. We get this job and we stop because this is my job. I go to work nine to five come home, cook dinner, play with my kids, put them to bed, Netflix, right? Chill out. Hate my life. It sucks. 
I get to bang my wife two and a half times per week, you know, like <laughs> with, with my two and a half kids, right? You know, like that's, it's just boom, 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 boom. It's just monotonous. It's terrible. How could you not have a breakdown? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It's, I think it's, it's just get to the, like the comfort zone, right. In the cycles and it's actually the way the brain works and then the body's being conditioned too, especially if you go do the same job where it's not uh, physically active, if it's in an office or you're sitting, you know, the body's actually being trained to be in these spaces for longer periods of time. You have less energy and less inspiration. So an easy way that I recommend to people to do is just like start walking or change the pattern in any way, drive a different way home, go for a walk, follow your inspiration inspirations do a bit of art play an instrument go do martial arts you know with martial arts too you know people are asking me always which the right one to do i say you know do anything anything that you're going to move your body that you're going to explore that you're going to like test it you know like part of i'm sure your training and drills is like you know you're just pushing people to see how far they'll go to see their grit you know and like the conditioning is like you have more you have more um and then there's technique and there's all this other stuff that goes with it but they're learning about their body and it's such an important tool to understand because if we're not using the body in any way we don't really have that that connection and everything else gets a little bit disconnected and sedentary and all that other stuff i'm gonna get on my high horse in a, for a second here all i right. don't think i don't <laughs> think any of them are the okay ones i think there's one that's for sure head and tail heads head and <laughs> of all the others and I, there's, I, I do think there's reasons behind it. It's because I think it's jujitsu and I think it's because we can test it, right? Like we, I know that you, that you will go unconscious when I choke you and that your joint breaks at this point. Well, right? I, so yeah, I, I agree, especially with the uh, like efficacy and, and, and the other thing that I really like jujitsu is it still maintains the, the um, proper hierarchy of belts. They're real belts. That, that have to be earned and it and it requires all the other good things about martial arts of like showing up respect in, right. in the way it's processed it's not like a, a byway belt or a walmart belt right and i will to finish the the striking arts i mean i did them i did muay thai right i had to i, I fought in the ufc but the only way to really test it and i love muay thai it's the second best one uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the only way to really test it is to get hit the wrestlers are losing their minds right now uh, I, 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 I include rest. I include a grappling art is what I would say. Mm. Right. Um, I include, uh, but with, I'm sorry, back with the striking, like, man, I, I don't recommend anybody to get punched in the head. That's yeah. the only way we can test it. Mm. Right. You have to spar. So that's, that's not always the safest. And the sparring in wrestling and jujitsu is, is, uh, is safer, right? You, you can, you can do it for real. Right? Well, like, I can try to choke you for real. Yeah. And I, and I agree with that. And the, and you know, if it works too, like all of that stuff works. I know that, you know, when I went to Phuket top team in Thailand and I had a wrestling background in minimal jujitsu and even somebody one belt up would whoop me continuously. And I would have to tap because my arm would break. I'd be choked unconscious. If it were a fight, I would be toast now on, but after that, I went to China and I trained with Shaolin Kung Fu masters. Now okay. I don't know how they do in a UFC fight. They probably wouldn't do well. Um, but those guys, I don't know any UFC fighter that could break stone with two fingers and bigger pieces over his head. And that's a connection with mind and body and the way it moves. And so like the overarching theme of like martial arts using your body or, or boxing and maybe not getting hit, but just getting out there and being active. But also if you want to know defense, a hundred percent, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you're going to feel so much safer. And there's the, I've had, uh, what, there's a guy who held a gun to my head once traveling. Um, I had a machete um, that was going to kill another tourist, I think, I stepped in front of him. All of this was from martial arts. So I don't think I could have taken them. Maybe I could, maybe I couldn't. But doing these things and, and being in real world scenarios where I had at least enough ability and sense to know that I should be okay to handle myself. But, but that's the last thing I want to do. I want to run away in the opposite direction, but just having that, that confidence and real experience does give a sense of confidence for every single other thing that you do in your life. And you can, you can be safe. You know, you, you have much more probability of being safe. If something does happen. The, the conflict that we go through every day in our martial arts life, the fight that we do on the mats, it makes all the volume calm down so that you can go mm. deal with real world situations even when it comes down to a fight way better you're yeah. not freaking out like how are police officers 
don't have to get a purple belt in my mind is beyond me. Like it should be a prerequisite for the job. Like, like you have to have a purple belt. You have, yeah. you have, you have, because it's not because I need you to know how to fight. Yeah, of course that's it. But you need to know how to not fight. Right. Yeah. You need, you need to know how to go. God damn. If I could deescalate this and the only way you can deescalate a situation is to know that you could actually handle the situation. Well, then you don't have to put your hand down on your gun because the second someone puts their hand on their gun and they're talking to me, I get real fucking scared. Right. Like every, we all do. Because now we're going to a level where we're not just having a disagreement. You're talk, you're talking about killing me. You know, you're talk, you're talking about taking this to a level where one of our lives is going to end, rather than okay, we're in an argument right now. We can be in an argument, and if you, as the officer, know how to defend yourself for real, like if I'm standing five feet away from you, man, you don't need a gun. Close the damn gap. It's already closed. Handle it. But if you don't know how to, I understand why you need your gun, you know, and yeah. if, you, if you, if you, if you are so intense and you are so, so wound up with your ego and what might happen to you, I understand why you pull your gun out and then watch the situation go way worse. Yeah. And you touched on something I think is super important uh, at the beginning. I think this is what you were sharing, but when you know that and you have that feeling when you're in the situation, you are so much calmer. Calm. What you do not want is somebody, they're afraid for their safety. So they're taking out that big thing, the gun or the, or the weapon or the thing that's going to keep them safe. And that's why it's a very dangerous situation. And that's why, you know, if you, like as a young man growing up, 18, 20, going in and you see all these bar fights, it's only people that have like, you know, there's something that they're trying to prove. There's something going on in, in their life that they have to go through this thing but when you're kind of whole and complete you can run away and the other uh, my buddy gave me the i was doing martial arts and i was messing with them right and uh we're just fooling around he goes he goes i can run i can run faster scared than you can mad and i just laughed and i love that and yeah. when you're when you learn that you can run away it's okay you don't lose your manhood it's like i'd rather do that than for you it would be like go into it and have to break this guy's arm because that's going to feel awful Man, I might get my arm broken. What do yeah. You, who knows? I don't want that. What if I'm dealing with some killer? You know, yep. so that's better than me. Like, I, I don't want that. What, what would it take for me to get into a fight right now? Dude, are you kidding me? Like, my life would have to be on the line or my children or my wife's. Like, that, like that's it. What, you're going to call my, you called my wife a bitch? Man, are you crazy? <laughs> you call you know you call I'm 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 black you know you call me the race I'm I'm black Jew so if you just go you drop those two, I won't do it if you just drop those two <laughs> racial slurs right there you're like oh God no Elliot please don't do that they'll have they'll make me take this down right you just go you blank blank right yeah. like that you yeah. think that's gonna make me fight no man that's my ego that's gonna make me fight yep so yeah and especially especially in a position of power. Um, man, I, I know you got to run. You got to pick gotta up run. your, I got to get my kids. You pick up your time. kids, Rule man. number one. But I just want to, yeah. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for, um, the philanthropic work you're doing. Thanks for writing the book for, for, you know, just trying to share your experiences and, and, you know, getting the word out there for people who might be uh, doing similar things, all the best for your schools and your academy and family. Is there anything that you want to leave the listeners with and uh, where can they get and learn more about you? Yeah. Hit me up on Instagram guys, fire Marshall two Oh five. That's where you can, you know, anything, you, you know, hit me up and then, Oh, what did I just do? Sorry. And then, uh, man, find your power guys. You all, every, every single one of you has it. Everybody, you know, nobody's special. I know your mommy's told you that you were, you know, <laughs> my mom did too, but none of us are special. <laughs> we're all unique, man. We're all unique, but we're not special. So lose that idea that you are, you know, for the good or the bad, you know, for the good or the bad, lose that idea and then just find what you love so that you can find your power and then you can grind. You're going to have to grind your ass off, but you can do it. Nothing's holding you back. Awesome, man. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you guys for listening. Have an amazing day. Catch you in the next one. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. See you, brother. Peace.